and our studio is just, just down the street. And as he said, you know, this is an opportunity to find out, maybe get a little insight into mastering and what we do and why we do it. Uh, so, uh, but, and, but we are gonna uh, go around for a collection afterwards, you know, so. <laughs> No, no, uh, yeah, anything, if you have any questions, whatever, uh, hopefully we can give you some insight. Why don't you take two, not a long time, I mean, you could talk yeah. for an hour about your resume, but just give a quick resume of what you did before you started Bernie Grunman Mastering here, because your, the rest of your well, history is very interesting. Sure, well, I started out, uh, in 1966 at Contemporary Records. So I was there for a couple years, and at Contemporary, I met, of course, a lot of very important people. I was doing a lot of mastering because I would do adjustments. And in those days, when you went to master something and you made a recording for RCA, Capital, Columbia, or whatever it was, there was no adjustment. A mastering engineer, the reason why they called him a mastering engineer was because he cut a master disc, and that's all. Now, and then at that time, it was just becoming a creative part of the business where adjustments were being made because I was right there at that first wave of people that were doing that because Contemporary was set up to, to deal with recordings that when they were recorded, they weren't you know, uh, adjusted properly and they had a very elaborate setup in order to actually, in a sense, mix a two-track recording. A lot of those recordings that we all love were direct to two-track, but a lot of adjustments were done in mastery. And so I worked there with Lester Koenig, and that's where I learned a lot about how to adjust sound. And of course it attracted a lot of people around the city because if you were at Capitol and you made a record for Capitol and you wanted to change a mix, and you needed just maybe a little top end or something, you had to go back in the studio, run it through the board, add some EQ or whatever you want to do, make a tape copy, this is a generation down now, it's going to hurt it, quality-wise, and then you would insert it in the assembly so the mastering engineer could cut it flat. And all the mastering engineer needed to know was how to make a, a record that would track well, uh, and it would fit on the disc and all of these things, all of those little parameters, uh, uh, the basic parameters. But they had uh, guidelines, LPs were this level, long LPs were this level, 45s were this level, and that's all they did. Okay, so after, you, after Contemporary, you went to Then after Contemporary, I went to a and I was doing most of their work at Contemporary, but when they opened their studios on La Brea, it was, the, it was an obvious place for me to go because I had developed a very close relationship with Herb Alpert and all those people, uh, you know. And they cared, about, they, they cared about sound. The, uh, and they, yeah, and, and, and A&M was concerned about sound. In fact, in that whole period, a top priority for a lot of engineers all around L.A. was quality. It's not quite the same now. <laughs> you know, it's not quite the same. But in those days it was, and that's why because of the way we were doing it at Contemporary, it attracted a lot of business. So I was able, I was in the, at, at the right place at the right time. Okay, and that, Kevin, Kevin Gray, check. Tell, tell us, tell us, you have a lot of his records, I'm sure, too. Tell, tell us. Uh, oh, okay, uh, I, I own Coherent Audio um, here in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, I've been independent since uh, the end of 2010. Uh, I started out working at Artisan Sound in Hollywood back in 1972 and um, worked for Bob for about five, six, seven years, and then I went on to... Um, Who's Bob? Bob McLeod, the owner, original owner of Artisan Sound Recorders. And uh, then I went on to um, uh, Location Recording Service, and Future Disc Systems, and then Acoustac, and now by owner. And art, people will know Artisan Records, oh, when you take old records out, it's got a particular kind of scribe. It's right, it has, a, well they have a stamp that had a little A with a circle around it. It looked kind of like the Columbia Masterworks, only with an A. Right. <laughs> and that, th those are like the Rolling Stones, did their records there? Yeah, oh yeah. I, you know, Bob is kind of an unsung hero as far as I'm concerned because he, he did uh, all of the Stones records after uh, Let It Bleed. Let It Bleed was the first one. He did almost all of the Doors albums except the first three. Um, and um, yeah, it's a lot of great stuff for Electra Warner. Yeah, his name is not well known. It isn't. No. Why isn't he? He's not as self-promoting as the three of you. Is that what it is? 
Well, he retired really early in 77, sold the business and moved on, so yeah. made his mark and left. Okay, and uh, Chris Bellman, you work with Bernie now, but... I do. And, and you And in 1984, I joined up with Bernie here, and I've been there ever since. How many people that are here, when they buy used records, look in the inner groove area to see who cut it and where it was pressed and all that stuff? And you notice that certain records, if, if these guys' names are in it, or it's, it's, they sound better for some reason. You know, and so I want to ask them, why is that? And oh, I'm serious, all three of you guys, stuff that you do sounds amazing. Now, oh, we left you there. Okay, this guy comes from the digital world, but he's a vinyl fan anyway, from DTS. So why don't you tell, tell us your, who you are and, and your background? Doesn't he deserve a microphone? I mean, I know he, he's fucking <laughs> <Sure. laughs> cool. Hi, um, my name is Rob, uh, Robert Tame. I work for DTS um, in Calabasas, and I'm um, an engineer, different kind of engineer to these guys. Uh, to work more with software. Um, I graduated in the UK with a degree in electroacoustics in 94, um, and then I went on to do a master's in digital music processing. So I'm um, now working with DTS. I've, I used to work for a company some of you may have heard of called GenX. They made master audio um, uh, recorders, and uh, we worked on a number of uh, titles over for uh, studios like Abbey Road, Metropolis, places like that, and a few uh, projects over here. Um, so I was involved with the software development for their DSD, Direct Stream Digital Recorders, um, the first commercially available DSD recorder, uh, which did, was a format that didn't really take off, but um, still yeah. Going. It's still, uh, still going, it's still going. Yeah, yeah. The audio files is still going. Right, and you know it sounded amazing. It's uh, it, and that was my first kind of exposure to the actual, the tangible difference in, in the sound quality work in the Gen X and uh, hearing the difference for the 24-bit. 192 kilohertz recordings and the DSD recordings, um, and it's it's kind of uh, part of what's driven me in the DTS, which does the same kind of thing. We're dedicated to ensuring that whatever is heard in the mastering studio is what the consumer hears at home through their home entertainment system. So that's our job is to try and as faithfully reproduce that experience that you guys get in the home. So my first question is this: So we're in 2015 now, and this vinyl thing is pretty big right now. Did you guys ever expect it to come back the way it's come back? Actually, no, no, I, you, I never thought this would happen. And I wasn't even sure when it came back, I thought, uh, I don't know if it's going to last. And I was kind of afraid that it wouldn't last. I don't see too many hipsters but it, out here. No, but it actually. keeps growing and growing. But I want—I do want to say something about what you said about quality or why why they, they, they report they, these discs sound seem to sound better or they tend to sound better than the average record. And I think it's because of where we all come from. Uh, you know, I'm first an audiophile. I was the kid when I was a teenager that hung out at the hi-fi shop before stereo. And I spent all my money on records and audio equipment. So my primary reason why I wanted to get into the music industry, get into the recording industry, was because I was concerned about really natural, realistic, great sound. So I'm very sensitive to that. I'm always looking for that. And anybody that works in the industry, in any industry in a lot of ways, knows that there's always more that probably could be done because we're still not quite getting 100% of what's on that master tape when it comes out to the public. And, the, and, the, and the, the, the goal for people like us is we're trying to figure out ways to cut a cleaner disc and deliver to the public what we're hearing in the studio. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever get 100%, but because, but we're the kind of people that tinker around with this stuff and hot rod the equipment and we, we experiment and we're listening. We're not, a lot of the new wave mastering engineers are into what I call cheap thrills because what they're really into is they're just being competitive. They're trying to make like maybe a loud record that attracts attention. Uh, they, they don't really notice how much destruction they're doing musically to the music in, in, in just to make things uh, attract attention or to be loud or whatever, all this whole this crazy thing about competitive levels and so forth. And, and we, we have to succumb to it too sometimes because we have clients. You know, if we were only making audio, well maybe now it'd be okay, but if we were only making audio file records, we might starve. You know, we'd still have to do pop, mainstream, and we have to try to deliver to these 
producers, record companies, and so forth, a product that they think is going to be competitive. Our, our trick is, is that we're trying to make it competitive and still have it sound good. So we design and build a lot of our own equipment in order to do that. So we don't do just all just start and pick any plug-in that makes it loud. We, we design a lot of stuff or we hot rod a lot of stuff in order to make it better.